Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we began to introduce the book of Joshua. This is season two of the podcast. Um, and today we're going to talk more about the person Joshua, but not about his book, because he has a whole career before he writes his book. In fact, we have five occasions to talk about. And these five occasions that we see written for us in Exodus and Numbers happen to correspond to the five points of the covenant. And it sounds like, Greg, that was not intentional, that it's just so embedded in your psyche that when you're writing, <laughs> you <laughs> naturally come to five points and they're the five points or, of the covenant. Or it's become so completely embedded in your thinking that you see it everywhere. See <laughs> the five points behind every tree. Or so. if we want to <laughs> channel some young, it's so embedded in the general human consciousness that when we write anything, it comes through as an embe embedded version of the general human consciousness. One of those. Pick, One of, pick, yeah. Pick, yeah. Take your pick. Yeah. Or the spirit really likes five and yeah. <laughs> likes showing covenants everywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, something. Anyway. So, how did you here. choose these five occasions to write about in, in the article, which is the basis for this episode? Well, I would like to – no, that's a complete lie. I would not like to claim complete credit for this because <laughs> I can't. Uh, largely, this is called ripping off another book. This is um, – the basis for this, at least in its broad outline, is Francis Schaeffer's book, Joshua and the Biblical Flow of History or Flow of Biblical History or something like that. I forget the accurate title. Uh, I always which, just thought it was called Joshua. So. Well, that's the big word on the title. <laughs> yeah. but it's about the flow of history as well. And, and Schaefer fastens on Joshua out of all the books he could have written about because it's the transition between the Torah, which we all know was inspired because plagues on Egypt, Shekinah, glory on mountain, bread from heaven, water from rocks, you know, earth opening its mouth and swallowing people. Joshua who? Um <laughs> And so it, it's very important at that crucial moment of, of covenant transition that the next generation say, oh, that jo Joshua, the son of Nun. Yeah, him. Um, sun stands still in the sky, river Jordan parts, Jericho's walls fall, and black spirituals are written. You know, it's got to be uh, because <laughs> Joshua the, rest, the, what now? <laughs> the rest of the Bible hinges on this handoff. If God can't successfully hand off from Moses to Joshua, then the books that follow lack credibility. Mm -hmm. And so Schaefer picked Joshua particularly for that reason, to show that God did successfully do the handoff. And having said that, well, then who is this Joshua guy? Why? How did God prepare him? What does a godly leader look like? So I picked these points largely by uh, skimming through Schaefer's book yet again. And... Um, grabbing what was on the surface, which, which are basically the times when Joshua shows up before the book of Joshua. Uh, there, there are some things that you could break into more appearances, but these tend to be the type of appearances. Uh, the, the first one stands apart. Some of the later appearances, and, jo and Moses did stuff, and Joshua was there. Moses did more stuff, and <laughs> Joshua was there. And Moses did more stuff, and Joshua was there. He's so, the and Robin. Yeah, he's the and Robin of, of the team, oftentimes. So that's why I picked him without any reference to whatever outline God or Dr. Schaefer or the collective human unconscious may have supplied here. But this is this is a good starting point as we come to the, the former prophets to see uh, we, we, we don't have Moses. We have Joshua. We have and Robin. So what happens when God goes to and Robin? What if he goes to people who don't at first seem all that great or all that spectacular, who we we don't know that much about. Can God use such a person? Doesn't, you know, don't we need like multiplied frogs and, and blood and babies dying and before we really can be sure this is the word of God? God didn't think so. And there's, there's Joshua is just fun to talk about because we do see his character developed in scripture over a very long period of time, over 40 years, in fact. So that's that's what we're going to do, I guess. We're going to look at Joshua as he appears in Scripture, beginning with the Exodus. The um, children of Israel have successfully escaped the clutches of Pharaoh. The Red Sea has destroyed 
Pharaoh's army. They've sung the song of Moses and the Lamb, the song of the sea. Uh, they've got their manna from heaven. And as they're going on through Rephidim, we are told that the people called Amalek attack them from the rear. Uh, Amalek seems to be descended from Esau, so they carry on the theme of the alienated older brother, the jealous older brother who wants to come and create trouble and stir up things and make a mess for God's people, a theme that goes all the way into the New Testament with uh, the Herods, who were also mm -hmm. Edomites. But Am uh, Amaleks are a particularly vicious version of this, and they they come and they strike the stragglers. And, and God uh, has Moses call, out of nowhere, Moses said to Joshua, and we don't you know, we find out later that Joshua was not his first name or his real name. It was Hosea, which means salvation. But Moses called him Yahashua. Jehovah is salvation. Thus giving him the name, well, Yahashua, Yeshua, Jesus. First person in scripture to bear that name. So that's, that bodes interesting things for him. Moses said to Joshua, choose out men and go and fight with Amalek. And tomorrow I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said. This is in chapter 17 of, of Exodus. And he fought with Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. When we let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. And Aaron, Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. The one on the one side, the other on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. There's a little bit more, but that'll, that'll do for a start. Uh, Joshua comes out of nowhere. The, he's called a young man, but the word itself is a little ambiguous in Hebrew. It, it may be a retainer or deacon or servant or lackey or something. Or he may be yeah. relatively young. Is this uh, the same word that shows up with... Um the lads who are calling out to Elisha? I, that's an excellent question to which I do not know the answer without looking. But if anybody wants to check on the Hebrew while we're doing this, that'd be great. The, the thing, though, is Joshua, being a Hebrew, has been a slave. Where did he learn strategy and tactics? Why does Moses turn to him? Why do people say, oh, obviously, we're going to follow this guy into battle? Best guess is that he was the slave of some Egyptian general. Now, secular history says that Moses himself was something of a general in his day and that he had served in the Egyptian army and led a successful campaign against Ethiopia, for whatever the historians are worth. Uh, perhaps something similar is true of Joshua. Perhaps he worked for a general who realized that this young man had promise and he taught him how to use the sword. Not the thing you normally do with slaves. You know, hey, here's a you weapon. Don't want an on <laughs> your yeah. Let me teach you how to use the sword just for future reference. Um, a little odd, but it, apparently it happened. And so Joshua comes on the scene already a trained military commander, a leader of men, and apparently rather fearless about it. I, I think this is important because when we get to Joshua itself, the one thing that Joshua is told over and over again by God, by the elders, by the people. You remember? <laughs> Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And I've wondered at that often because he does not seem like a fearful sort of man. He charges into battle when he was very young. And yet 40 years later, people are telling him, don't be afraid. It's possible he had some kind of life incident and let me warfare more difficult to him, lost his sight, his hearing, got use of a hand. I, I suspect that's not it. I suspect that what frightened Joshua is the kind of thing that frightens me, which is, you mean I have to deal with people? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a sword. Tell me to run it through them. I'm good. Tell me I have to make peace between them and get them to go along with the plan. I've watched Moses for 40 years. I don't want this job. Anyway. <laughs> so, But anyway, from, from his earliest days, as he appears in Scripture, he's a war leader, general. But he learns some lessons that day. He learns that however good he is and however good his troops are, and they weren't necessarily all that good, their success depends upon God's providence, God's blessing, which in turn depends upon prayer. God ordains that his people should pray. And when they pray, God turns those prayers into action. So God does these things, and yet God wants to be asked. And, and, and until that happens, 
there's no assurance of victory. Now, there's there's a whole bunch of imagery going on here. We have the the two witnesses, a priest and king, holding up the hands of the prophet, the gospel ministry, and all that. But the practical lesson for for Joshua is you're going to win a battle. Well, first of all, you know what? God's people have enemies, and some of them come at you with swords. People like that need to be met with swords. There are some people in this world who need to be fought with swords, with deadly force. That's not the general calling of most of God's people at most times, but it's a thing. And and for Joshua, very much a thing. Uh, Secondly, when you do this, you need to pray. You need to trust God and you need to ask God specifically for victory. Uh, And third, this is not magic. You're not manipulating God. But God, liking to be asked, likes also to answer on his terms. And so as long as Israel expressed their dependence upon God by holding up Moses' hands, Israel won. And when the hands went down, Israel lost. In the end, Joshua wins, discomfits Amalek. And then God says something interesting to Moses. This is verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called the name of the Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. (laughs) So when my parents were young camp counselors, there was a rule at camp that you you weren't going to tell jokes about ethnicities for (laughs) obvious reasons. It would be very cruel and unkind. But if the ethnicity were entirely wiped out, like, for instance, the Amalekites <laughs> and the Philistines, you could tell all sorts of jokes. So you've got all these jokes about the Amalekites, the Philistine, walk into a, well, you wouldn't say walk into a bar because it was a Christian camp, but they're walking down the street. <laughs> walk into a tea house? I don't know. Do what, 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 in a Christian camp, what do you walk into? I'm not sure. I don't know. I think I've only been to one Christian Juice camp. Bar? A VBS. VBS. There you go. They walk into a VBS. All right. <laughs> I don't know. Is it okay to slander a people if they don't exist anymore, given that they have immortal souls? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know. (laughs) Anyway, the the interesting thing here is not so much that God told Moses to write this down, but he said, rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I want to witness to what I'm swearing here. I'm going to swear that I am going to completely wipe Amalek out, and it will take a long time last Malachite that we know of, dying in the book of Esther, Haman, the Agagite, descendant of Agag. But Joshua is is, is told, hey, God's putting your name in this book. I'm collecting and collating and writing a fivefold book that's going to be the word of God for all people in all time. Your name's going in the book. I I don't know. How does one deal with that? Like, yay? Yay? Fear and trepidation. Fear and trepidation. Yeah, yeah that I might could... be where the fear comes in. <laughs> um, do we really have to, Master? I don't know that I want my name in there. But he's not given a choice. He doesn't get a vote on this. He's, his name is in the book. And so God has some kind of purpose for this young man. This much we can see right away. The next time we run into him is in the, the whole incident with the golden calf. This is a few chapters later. Chapter 32, you know the story that Moses is up on the mountain. What we often forget is that Joshua, being his minister, deacon, gopher. Right-hand man. Right-hand man and Robin, um, (laughs) stayed with him throughout throughout all of this. So he's not in the camp when the children of Israel decide after... 40 days that um, they've given up on Moses. They don't know what's become of him and they want some thing to lead them to be their cell phone to God. And they create this golden calf and they start throwing a party. Well, God breaks off his discussion with Moses and says, your, your people, which you brought out of the land of Egypt, corrupted themselves. <laughs> Moses, your people. Yeah. Moses replies, well, wait, why are you angry with your people that you brought up out of the land of Egypt? I don't want these people. Well, shut them on me. <laughs> um, but uh, God sends him down, and along the way, he finds Joshua, who's dutifully waiting for him there. And Moses has the two tables of stone that God has written upon. Uh, and uh, when Joshua hears the noise, Moses catches up to him, and Joshua hears the noise. He says, "There's a noise of war in the camp," because he's he's a military guy. He hears loud noise. 
he thinks the people are being attacked. There's war Shrapnel. going on. Yeah. And, and Moses' response is interesting. It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that shout the cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. Sorry, Joshua, your um you just failed your um observation role and uh you completely missed this one. Quit quit thinking like a soldier. This is not a military attack. This is they're having a party. And from I have good intel from God that it's not we we were deliberately not invited. So we better get down there and see what's going on there. And you know the story. They come down um, and see the calf, and Moses does what Moses does. And it ends up with 3,000 dead executed by the Levites who step forward when Moses says, who's on the Lord's side. We're not told what Joshua was doing during all this, but he's, he's watching, most certainly. And he's learning that idolatry has consequences, mortal consequences. You can get yourself and your friends and family killed by worshiping idols. And again, we need to remember that the Israelites were not replacing Jehovah with some mm -hmm. kind of Egyptian deity, which is how it's often presented. They said, this is your God, this is Yahweh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Not that they thought that God looked like a cow, but um, that this is a representation of that power that we know to be Yahweh, of, of what God has done for us and how he reaches out to us. The, the calf or the young bull was the chief of the sacrifices. If they had made a golden lamb and worshipped it, we would have figured it out. Mm -hmm. But we, we think of Jesus as the lamb of God. We forget he's also the bull of God and the goat of God and the dove of God because they were all sacrificial animals. But bulls were the sacrifices of rich people. Uh, and so they were just, they, they had their picture of God, their picture of how God reaches out to his people. And Moses learns, or rather Joshua learns, no, hmm. no, <laughs> this, this is not how this works. Uh, and, and whereas normally this would be, we would think of, of a swinging the sword as being the military kind of thing that Joshua would be given charge of. It's not. The Levites are appointed as guardians of the, the future tabernacle, the guardians of worship. And swords are put in their hand and they're told, go kill the idolaters. This is the holiness of God is at stake here. The holiness of worship is at stake here. So this is an important lesson for Joshua to learn. But more than this, when this is when they're still working all of this out, Moses pitches a tent outside the camp. Uh, now, the, the camp itself was laid out in a cruciform shape, three in one way, three in another direction, three in another, three in another, one of the three being longer because the tribe of Judah was particularly large. So from Sinai, it looked like a cross. And, but to go out, the point is to go out of that, to go from the center out, all you have to do is go to the nearest internal corner of the cross. You can, mm -hmm. you can be not that far from the center of everything. And so before there is a tabernacle, as we think of it, Moses is told to go pitch a tent out there where God will come and meet with his people. And uh, let me find the reference here. Chapter 33 of Exodus, God comes to talk to Moses about all of these things. And while he's talking about him, talking to him about all this, Verse 11 of 33, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. And he turned again into the camp, he being Moses. But, the ser but his servant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Okay, if things were kind of scary before, here you are with Moses, la, 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 I'm going into this tent. What's going on here, master? What are we doing? This is where God's going to come and meet with us. What? <laughs> um, God's going to show up here. I was on Sinai. That was kind of cool and scary and awesome and all. Maybe I should leave before. Oh, no, here he comes. I'll go. I'll go stand in this corner and uh, not I'll be, be, be shutting up. And God comes and talks <laughs> to Moses. And then God, the glory cloud lifts and Moses goes back. And Joshua is peeking out of the corner saying, um, why me? I mean, that's got to be the question, doesn't it? What in the world is God doing? Why I'm I am I'm just this guy, you know. 
Uh, I, I'm pretty good with swords and maybe some strategy and tactics, but this has nothing to do with what I do. Love Moses, love the Word of God, love hanging out and hearing the Word of God, but why is God honoring me with all these things? I mean, he's not talking to me. I'm just over here in the corner, but I'm over here in the corner. What in the world is going on? What does God have in mind? I'm, 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 I can see him going home to his wife saying, I don't get this. Hmm. There are times, I think, in all of our lives when God does something, uses us in a particular way, and we stand back and say, why was that me? <laughs> There were other people who could have done that better. There are other people who are ordained to office who should have done that better. Why did I do that? And why does God seem to be blessing it? And, um, and, and depending on who we are, oh, I hope I get to do more of that. Or more likely, I hope I don't have to do that again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, the, the, that's, so that's the second time. What is God up to? And why me? The next encounter is in Numbers. Numbers chapter 11. Uh, yeah, the people complained and it displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it. His anger was kindled. And, and there, there is judgment for that. Those things are already not going well. And yet when that's done, the mixed multitude falls to lusting and weeping and saying, who will give us flesh? We remember the fish and the cucumbers and the leeks and the garlands and all that. Um, and Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man at the door of his tent, very public kind of weeping and carrying on. Hmm. The anger of the Lord public was- Public protest. Public protest. The anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. Now, generally it is Moses' role to play mediator. God gets angry. <laughs> And God has ordained that Moses on those occasions will step between him and play the role of Messiah, of mediator, and call upon God to honor his covenant, remember his name, and all those things. That's not supposed to go. What happens when your mediator says, kill them, kill them all. I am so <laughs> done with this. Why have you afflicted your servant? Wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou mayest lay the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say, carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth a sucking child into the land which you swear to your fathers? When should I give flesh to this people? I am not able to bear all this people because it's too heavy. If you deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee. It's not even saying kill them. It's saying kill me. <laughs> At which point God says, um... Yeah, let's fix this. And God calls out 70 men. He says, Go get, gather 70 men who are already acting elders among the tribes. We're going to make them national elders. We're going to make them senators is what we would probably call them. And they're going to help you. You're not going to have to do it all by yourself again. Because he remembers our frame. He knoweth that we are but dust. So that's that's going on. And, and Moses has... The tribes select the, these elders, 70 of them, and they come out and the spirit, the glory cloud descends and God takes the spirit from Moses, like when we're lighting a candle from, other, from another candle, and places it on each of the elders so that they too will be prophets. They will declare the word of God. They will be able to rule and judge in terms of God's word. But it turns out there are a couple of people who aren't there. The, the names of these men were Eldad and Medad. They they didn't they didn't make the ordination ceremony in time. They're back in the camp doing something. And yet the Spirit of God fell upon them too. They were of the number written. That is, they had met all the qualifications. They'd been chosen, but they hadn't got out there where they needed to be for whatever reason. No blame is attached to them. They just weren't there. Uh, but a young man comes running out of the camp to, to Moses and says, Eldad and me, Dad, do prophesy in the camp. And here's Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men. See, there were a number of young men about Moses. He had a number of servants and apprentices and hangers-on and gophers. So Joshua, at this point, is only one of them. And yet he's, he's had some very special privileges. So he feels it incumbent upon himself to protect the honor of Moses. And he says to Moses, my Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses looks at him and says, enviest thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. So that's our next encounter with Joshua. He is very jealous for the gospel ministry, for the office of prophet, and particularly for Moses' leadership. And he says, but we're not 
This is not the due order. We haven't crossed all our T's and dotted all of our I's. We haven't signed the form intra in the places injured, indicated, and initialed all of the proper spots. So this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and Moses says, in so many words, get over it. <laughs> <Too bad. laughs> I appreciate them. So. Um, I have a tangent. Yeah. Um, isn't there a parallel here with the spirit in the New Testament? When the gospel is going out into the wider world mm -hmm. and the gifts of the spirit are being manifest to show that even though you're not the 12 apostles, you're still, you still are, are, have the authority given from God to preach and declare his word of peace. Well, the things that come to mind, first of all, the day of Pentecost, because mm -hmm. here we got 120 people. We don't know if any of them were among the 70 that Jesus ordained. Certainly the 12 were there. Uh, and yet the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they start prophesying, speaking in, in foreign languages. Um, that's kind of out of nowhere. And of course, the Pharisees and Sadducees give them a hard time. You have it, you know, where's your... Uh, Where's your certificates? Where are your degrees? Which some theological seminary did you graduate from? What rabbis have you sat under? Um, let's see the documentation and the forms fill out in triplicate. But then when the gospel goes to the Samaritans and, and then to the Gentiles and the Peter's preaching, something similar. The gifts uh, of the Spirit manifest themselves. And the particularly with the Gentiles, the reaction of the Jews back in Jerusalem is, Peter, what are you doing? How come you're going to Gentiles and eating with them and doing all this stuff? And we hear you even baptize them. What were you thinking? They haven't been circumcised yet. And Moses has to say, the Spirit came on them. Peter says. Uh, Peter says. Peter says. Moses. Sorry, well, yeah. <laughs> the Spirit fell on them. It's on us at the beginning. What did you expect me to do? <laughs> If they've received the Spirit, baptism seems kind of a late afterthought, but we should probably do it anyway, because they have the reality. Mm -hmm. They've been baptized into the body of Christ on equal terms, without the circumcision. So they should be, they should have been baptized as well. So, and, and, and these things do, do set the pattern. Moses' wish was that all of God's people should be prophets and that they would all have God's Spirit. Well, that's the wonder of the New Covenant when he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than the greatest of the old covenant prophets, because we have the complete word of God, and we have an unction and an anointing from God, from the Holy Spirit, and we know all that God has revealed to us. God has fully revealed himself in his Son. We have that revelation scripture. We are prophets. We have the word, and we can say, thus saith the Lord, and it doesn't even depend upon what we've heard or seen. We can hold up the Bible and say, read it for yourself. It's right here. And and so, yeah, this, this thing continues. Moses wanted the manifestation of the Spirit centering around the Word of God to, to multiply throughout God's people. He was glad to get two more. And so this is the next lesson that Joshua has to learn, that we, we don't need fewer people who have the Spirit. We need more people who have the Spirit. And we need not be jealous of the particular forms of ordination. Yes, God has set orders, and they should be observed as, as we're able. But that, that's for order and form and, and, and such. The reality is something else. Should be yeah. recognizing what God has done. It's not we the thing to... that you do that makes it. Right, exactly. And Joshua has to learn that. And, and as we go in the Bible study, we're going to the book of Amos. And Amos is going to say at some point, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. Uh, and God came to me. He I was a, a, a herdman, a, a follower of the flocks, and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And God came to me and he said, go prophesy to my people. So I did. And you, 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 here you are. You may not like the message, but it's it's from God. Uh, and, and it behooves us as God's people. When someone comes to us, it be some old man of a different ethnicity and a different social status sitting in the bus terminal. He says, son, let me tell you what God says about that. We, and, and what he says is actually the word of God. We should listen. If it's a five-year-old child who says, daddy, shouldn't we pray now? Yes, we should. I mean, <laughs> so we listen because we, we, we listen for the word of God in whatever context it comes up. Yes, it would be nice if we, if everybody were ordained on time and, 
you know, everything was set in order and everyone passed their, their theology exams, and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> but particularly in times of ecclesiastical crisis, in times when there's persecution, in times when faith is running low, in time when apostasy is running high and there are false prophets and false teachers everywhere, sometimes you go with a guy who's got the word of God. And this is something Joshua has to learn, that uh, the spirit of God is known by the word of God. You want, you want a spiritual experience, don't go for the signs and wonders. Go for the people who have the word of God and who declare it boldly. That's where you're going to find God. So this is, this is the next of his, of his things. Uh, a note that, uh, that I wrote, leadership mustn't be self-aggrandizing. I can't even say that word, self aggrand aggra What's how do you pronounce that? Aggrandizing. Thank you. Spirit-filled leaders serve God and his people, not themselves. And leaders don't always show up the way we expect. God can work in surprising ways. We can't bind God's spirit with our rules or protocols. But those who lead in God's kingdom do have one thing in common. They speak the word of God and the power of God's spirit. So another thing that Joshua had to learn with the view to where, what, how God will use him ultimately, and yet Joshua still doesn't know, what is this all about? Oh, look, I got my name in the Bible again. <laughs> Yay, because I said something stupid. <laughs> Another way he's like Peter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and in uh, the next time we, we run into Joshua, and this is where most people actually think of Joshua. Children of Israel come to the borders of the promised land. And Moses picks a spy from each of the 12 tribes to go in and spy out the land so that everybody has a voice, every tribe has a voice in what they see and what they say and how they're going to support what God has said they should do. And they wander through the land for 40 days. And of these, we, we mostly think of Caleb, who is a representative of the tribe of Judah. But we also are told yet again that there is this guy named Hosea, the son of Nun. This is chapter 13, verse 8. But in verse 16, we're told... Um, these are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hosea, the son of Nun, Yehoshua, Jehovah saves. And so they go into the land and they spy it out. And after 40 days, they come back. And on the one hand, the report's very good. Oh, it's a beautiful land, wonderful land. Here's some of the produce. Look at these enormous grapes. Yeah, that's all good and well. However, there are huge cities and they are walled up to heaven. And there are giants in the land. And, and there were, and they were probably around eight or nine feet tall, give or take, maybe larger, big, bulky, you know, but frightening. And the children of Israel say, from our point, we look like grasshoppers to them. And we're sure that's how we must have, we, we were grasshoppers to them. And we saw us through our eyes and we look like grasshoppers. So there is absolutely no way we can win this battle. This is a dead end. Chapter 14, all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Aaron, against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us up into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to the land of Egypt? Let's make a captain and do that. Now, Would that the cicadas in Maryland <laughs> were so timid. <laughs> hey, I, this is a complete tangent, but um, my my girls were saying that cicadas are native only to the East Coast. Is this is there any truth in this? I have no idea. I know that they are currently in their once every seventeen years swarm where they're just absolutely everywhere, and it's disgusting. And I don't like to take walks anymore. <laughs> I know that there are like different species of cicada uh -huh. and i know that there were cicadas uh screaming their little lungs out uh in colorado uh -huh. a couple years ago so okay well we've They're heard things around loud. yeah we've heard things around here that we've called cicadas so loud. and they come for a while they go and they make yes lots of noise but my girls were saying but they don't exist on the east coast on the west coast according to omniscient google <laughs> Um, at which point I questioned omniscient Google. And yeah. It was not it was not plain that I was believed. Anyhow, that's the side issue. But it did <laughs> allow me time to let my eyes roam over the text of scripture and notice back in chapter 13 that when this issue began, the children of Israel first 
heard the report and, and was willing to believe it. Caleb stood up and said, no, 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 no. We, he steals the people. Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And the people don't want to listen to him. And so we go into the night and the whole night is, you know what happens. People sit around their campfires and they go from tent to tent and they gossip and they complain and they 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 vent <laughs> a nice unbiblical word for unbiblical things. And so in the morning, they're ready to talk about making a captain and going back to Egypt because that's going to fix things. Well, I mean, everything's scarier on the campfire at night too. It, it, it is. And obviously, going back and being slaves in an Egypt that is now desolate would somehow fix this. <laughs> I mean, the Egyptians, the, the Gentiles, the uh, unbelievers, the humanists are so much better at running civil government than we are. Let's just let them do it. And in fact, let's form a political party to enable them to take a, back over again so that we Christians don't have to have a hand in that because we just screw things up. We don't know anything about this side issue. Uh, this time, however... Joshua hadn't said anything the first day. This time, Joshua and Caleb jump in, tearing their clothes as a sign of mourning and fear. And they say, the, the land is good. It's exceeding good. If the Lord delight in us, he'll bring us into the land. Don't rebel against the Lord. Uh, their, their defense is departed from them. God's with us. And the congregation bade stone them with stones. The logic seems to be that attempted murder um, or particularly if you if you lie in court and commit perjury to get somebody killed, then you should be executed. Well, these men are calling upon God to try to get Israel to do something that will get them killed. So obviously they ought to be stoned for this perjury, calling upon God to say we should do what God says when it's obviously deadly. Well, God intervenes, as is his way. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people provoke me? How long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I've showed them? I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Well, Moses is back into godly form. The Egyptians will hear of it. In other words, Lord, your name is at stake here. So this is not the thing you really should be doing. By the time God is done with his final sentence, he says that this whole generation from 20 years up or from above 20 and up is going to die in the wilderness. They're not going to, they don't want the promised land. They're not going to get the promised land. They're going to wander until their carcasses fall in the wilderness and their children, 20 years and down, they'll inherit. So no one's going in except Caleb, the son of Japuna, and Joshua, the son of Nun. <laughs> okay. But uh, through this, he, he actually had said this before. The first time it was just Caleb. Josh was probably sitting there, wait, I, I, I wasn't. I was with him. I was with him. I, okay, the first day I didn't say anything, but I thought he had it covered. I didn't say anything. Oh, okay, okay, I am in, I am in. The question might be what Moses and Aaron were thinking at this point. Wait, mm. well, we're, we're, we're grandfathered in. We're included, right? Yeah, I'm sure we are. We get to see the promised land. Why wouldn't we? Well, they don't, obviously, in the end. Nice. Uh, and that's there's something there, too. Moses, who represents the law, does not it does not bring the people into the land, but the one whose name is Jesus does. So, again, here, Joshua, Joshua, for the last couple of things, has been more or less an observer, passive sitting, learning the lessons. But now the lesson, sort of like Queen Esther, is... You must witness or perish. You must stand up and be a public witness to what you have seen, and more important, to the word of God. They all saw the same thing. The evidence, the facts were the same thing. The interpretation of those facts was very different. And Joshua was called to publicly put God's interpretation on them and make it a matter of, of a public oath, a public witness, that this is the way it is. And had he not, then he probably would not have entered the promised land nor become, let alone become the leader of God's people and the one who writes, writes the sixth book of the Bible. And you know what? There were no warnings. There's no record that a voice came to him in the middle of the night and said, Joshua, Joshua, no, Joshua, tomorrow a big test is coming. It's going to stretch you. It's going to be hard. People are going to be looking at you. Hundreds, in fact, thousands of people are going to hang on your word, and you better be ready to say the right thing. 
what's the right thing? What's the right thing? Hello? <laughs> what's the right? What am I supposed to say tomorrow? What? Oh, no. You know, that never happened. I mean, he, he went into this thinking, Caleb was so great yesterday. And there's Moses, the man of God, the friend of God. I'll just sit here in the corner like I have so many times at what? I have to say something? <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Remember one of the first times I was in a situation like this. I'm saying to myself and those around me in whispers, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> I stand in my knee, come to my feet, my knees are shaking. Like, uh, okay, I need to say something here. <laughs> I was fairly young, but I should have been readier than I was. Uh, it, it can be scary. And again, I, I suspect that one of Joshua's fears probably is the, the, the fear that we all struggle with so much, the fear of man. What are people going to think? What are they going to say? They're, the, the great line from um, the Jimmy Stewart film, um, Rear Window, mm -hmm. um, the, the nurse is told, wait, they'll see you. Well, I've been looked at before. <laughs> <laughs> what, number, one, <laughs> number one fear, over even over fear of dying, is... Fear of public, public speaking. speaking. Fear of public speaking. Yep. I mean, and, and that's nothing. I mean, in, in a way, that's nothing. It's not simply speaking in front of people. It's taking a stand. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people can't even, it's not so much what they have to say. They just don't want to say anything. They're terrified. And on more than one occasion, I've had to stand in our poetry contest and, and look little girls in the eyes as they've stood on the stage. And look at me. Look at me. Don't look at the eyes. Don't look at the eyes. Look at me. Look at me. Keep saying. <laughs> keep going. You can finish this. And try to get them through that poem before they faint. Because it, it, that by itself is a fearful thing. But standing for God when the whole world's against you? This, this, this was a new sort of lesson that he had to learn. And, and he does, faithfully. The, before we get to, uh, to Joshua, the, last, the left, last reference in the Torah uh, begins in Numbers 27. And it looks like it's around verse 15. Um, we're getting to the end, and Moses by now understands that he's not going to go into the promised land because of his sin of striking the rock rather than speaking to it. He and Aaron are not going to inherit the land. But Moses does not at that point give up on the vision. He doesn't say, well, then fine, you find someone else to take care of them. I'm so out of here. I've had it. I'm done with these people. His, he's still wrapped up in the vision. He's still pursuing the heavenly city. And so, verse 15, Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. We're not told that Moses knew who that man was. There were, I mean, Caleb. Caleb would have been a great choice. Caleb had a track record, and later on, when they come to the promised land and they're, they've entered, Canaan, Caleb's the one who goes up to Joshua and says, give me a mountain full of giants. <laughs> Let me, me at him, boss. Let me at him. Give me Mount Hebron. <laughs> so in some ways, he would have been a great choice, and we're not told that Moses is not said to specifically have said, well, it's obvious you've been preparing Joshua, so can we go ahead and, and do the transition thing here? Or, God, <laughs> you haven't exactly asked for my vote, but Joshua's really been coming along the line, and, you know, it's it's been 40 years since that whole uh, standing up and being a witness thing. I think he's grown a lot in 40 years. Maybe we should use him. None of that. It's just, God, you know. We need somebody here. We need a shepherd. We need another Messiah. We need a prophet. So, please? Well, we can also kind of see uh, an echo of the continuing younger son motif, mm. where it, it's always the secondborn who takes the position. And typologically speaking, anyway, Caleb is sort of an older son. He's the, the one who goes out and wants to fight things. And he's <laughs> probably a little bit man. older. Yeah. And... Joshua's the younger one. He's the one in the corner. He's the one who's been learning by osmosis. <laughs> and so God chooses, again, to put someone whose name is Jesus into the second son position. And that's what he says. The Lord said to Moses, take the Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer, the priest, that's Aaron's son, and before all the congregation, and give him charge in their sight, 
And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be, may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim, of, of Urim before the Lord. And his word shall they go out, and his word shall they come in, both he and all the uh, children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and took Joshua, and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him, gave him the charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. And then Joshua drops out of the account again for a while. Notice that, that there's a couple things. Uh, the primary one, I guess, is he was going to stand before the high priest, and the pre high priest is going to ask counsel after the Urim and Thummim. That is, although, Moses, I have spoken to you face to face on a regular basis, it's not going to be that with Joshua. I'm giving him some of your honor, but not all of it. And in Deuteronomy, we're going to find out that God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses one day. Mm. But Joshua's not that prophet. In fact, as Joshua finishes off the book of Deuteronomy, wrapping, in, wrapping up what Moses had written and recording his death and burial, he says, and there has not arisen yet in Israel a prophet like Moses whom God knew face to face. Joshua mm. knows he's not it. He probably doesn't want to be it either. Uh, he, he knows his limitations. And so when he needs direct counsel from God, he has to go to the high priest who has the Urim and the Thumma, whatever they were, which give yes, no answers. So if he wants divine revelation, unless God overrides it, intervenes personally, which he does on occasion, he's working with the high priest now and he has to go work with him. So he's not going to be a second Moses. And yet, given what he is, he's still going to do what Moses could not do, which is bring the children of Israel into the inheritance that God swore to their fathers into the promised land. And this is uh, finished out in place. Deuteronomy 31, and Numbers comes to an end with the children standing on Jordan's stormy banks, casting wistful eyes into the promised <laughs> land. But there's a few minor things that have to be worked out, some matters of inheritance, some other details. And then we have the book of Deuteronomy, which is, although it's a long book, is, is actually a collection of four sermons and, and some related material that happens in a very quick time. So it's not like years and years are passing. It's, it's a few weeks are passing. And at the end of the time, and we've, been, we've worked through Deuteronomy before when we talked about covenant uh, continuity, covenant inheritance, and Christian education and such. There comes a point where it's time for Moses to formally pass the baton. In a sense, he's already done that. But he does it again. And we're told, this is chapter 31 of Deuteronomy, he gave Joshua, the son of Nun, a charge and said, Be strong and of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. So the transfer happens. Uh, it's it's re reaffirmed. There's a little bit more um, backing actually to verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, the day's approach that thou must die. Call Joshua, present yourselves to the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation. God appears in Shekinah glory. And he prophesies the future history. And he's going to put that in a song. But before that, and the song is chapter 32, we have the formal charge to Joshua. So Moses gives him the charge. God gives him the charge. Moses does the final steps of um, pronouncing blessing, and then he goes up into Mount Nebo and views uh, from afar the promised land, and then the angel of the Lord takes him home, buries the body. And it ends, as I said, with the children of Israel weeping, verse 9 of the last chapter. Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So there was not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders, and so on. And that's, that's how Deuteronomy the Torah end. So Joshua's taking command, and he's wonderful, and God's going to use him, but he's not the prophet. In some ways, he excels Moses. In some ways, he doesn't live up to what Moses was, but he's going to do what Moses couldn't do. And his name is Jesus, Yeshua. 
Uh, and then that introduces us to the book of Joshua. So we come to Joshua, and we're going to be spending some time here for the next few weeks looking at the conquest of the land and considering it from a number of angles. I, I forget what's next, but I think we're going to talk about what does God tell Joshua to do. Well, <laughs> see this see this book that Moses has been writing and your name's in? Start reading. It's your instruction manual. Um, I'm not going to be talking to you constantly like I talk to Moses. I don't need to. you got a book. Start studying the book. Meditate on the book. Read the book. Memorize the I book. I already told you. <laughs> yes. It's also just interesting, again, to look at the kind of uh the foreshadowing the the typology again that's 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 the drum that i hit every time this, this typology oh, okay, apparently good. you know you have moses he is the the prophet he is the prophet of law and he like you mentioned before this is what got me on this train of thought again is you know the one who brings the law doesn't get to go to the promised land right and if we're looking at these actors typologically then there's there's moses who represents uh the law there is joshua who represents jesus and the covenant of grace that brings salvation there is israel representing god's chosen people the church and mm -hmm. there is the promised land representing salvation and when you plug those pieces in it becomes a little obvious <laughs> the the message why galatians uh is so mm -hmm. strong about the relationship between faith and works and why paul in general is very strong on the difference between salvation by faith alone and salvation by faith plus something else mm -hmm. yeah uh, look at also the look... first few chapters of hebrews is that what you were yes, going to say yes that's where i was going to go <laughs> yep, yep. exactly yep. <laughs> For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of it another day. There remaineth therefore a Sabbath keeping to the people of God, for he that hath entered into his rest has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. But, and then the writer commends to us the word of God, which is uh, quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So here you are, you have a new Joshua to lead you into the promised land of salvation. And here's the sword of the Spirit. Joshua used an iron sword. We're going to use a different kind of sword, but the success, the victory is just the same. All right. That is a good place to wrap up for the evening. Uh, do you have any recommendations for us? No. I probably well, don't. has a list, right? <laughs> <laughs> While he's doing I, that, I'm going I'm to go ahead and recommend Dr. Schaefer's book, hmm. uh, and I will get the title right now, Joshua and the Flow of Biblical History, published originally by InterVarsity. It's probably been republished. And there are some premillennial elements in it, I will warn you up front. They're, they're not very explicit, but it's at points I think they get in the way of, of developing his argument. If you've been a little better with his biblical theology and from post mill, it would have been a stronger <laughs> book. But it is there's still a lot of good material in there. And it's an easy book. It's a book that, that teenagers and preteens can read with much pleasure. It's in the green volume if you have the rainbow set of Schaefer. Oh yes. Uh, Which I don't have, but wish I had. <laughs> one day, one day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and recommend uh, Rod Dreher's Live Not by Lies, which mm. everyone and their pastor has been talking about for the past I year. I just ordered or... it. I'm very um, glad to hear you. I need it. to. Thank you for recommending It's quite it good. It, it is quite good. I, I do find it interesting that this is a complete tangent from the issues and the content of the book. It's more about Rod Dreher himself. And I, I find it really interesting how people react to Rod Dreher and talk about <laughs> him. Because it's like, A, Rod, Rod just, he publishes all of his thoughts. He's just like, <laughs> I had a thought today. I'm going to write an article. And it could contradict something he said last year. It doesn't matter. He's like, this is what I think today. <laughs> but it's really weird to see people like who I don't think have ever read anything he's written mm -hmm. criticize him for being effeminate for some reason. Like it's just <laughs> like that. That's the thing that people throw darts at. It's like the, that's the new as Nazi is to leftists, so effeminacy <laughs> is to um, these these kinds of individuals. So I find it really interesting because he 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 writes very lucidly in this particular book and draws from the historical examples and, and from uh, particular Christians' examples as they lived under um, very, very harsh 
communist and socialist regimes that um, explicitly outlawed and castigated Christians and the Christian faith. And it's really, I, I think part of it has to do with the fact that he's Eastern Orthodox now. They're just a bit jealous. Okay, well, yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that could have something to do with it. Emily, do you have one? I do. I'm going to recommend Slow Roasted Salmon. Ooh. Um, there's a little a YouTube book? video. <laughs> no, what? no, it's it's a YouTube it's a video actually. Oh, okay. All right. Um, it's it's a food. Ah. Um, there is one and a half cooking channels on YouTube <laughs> that I like, um, and this one is called Internet Shaquille, and it's just so no nonsense and so simple and to the point um, that I really appreciate it and. It's one of these recipes where it's like, I that sounds way too complicated. I, I don't want to do that. And then it's like, well, I'll just get it started. And then I'm done because it's very straightforward. <laughs> um, so slow roasted salmon. I'll link the YouTube video because you don't want to hear me describe how to make it because Internet Shaquille does it so much better. There we go. Okay. I'm all for roasting salmon. All right. Well, oh, I have also from David a couple of housekeeping details before we wrap up. Uh, we do have a website now, which oh. is new to season two. <laughs> uh, you can find us at haltingtowardzion.com. Wow. Which is pretty neat. Apparently it's a, it's a bit prettier than our Anchor website, which is not super well designed. We didn't get to design that. That's kind of just what Anchor gave us. So now we have haltingtowardzion.com. It's better. You can go there if you there we go. go to a website. Another thing is that we are on Rumble, which is very exciting. Um, so Rumble, if you've not heard of it, is a video hosting website, kind of similar to YouTube, except now that we have an alternative to YouTube, we can say whatever we want about how evil communist China is and YouTube won't be able to do anything about it because we'll be on Rumble. Um, okay. Yeah. Well then. Yeah. We're also still on YouTube until they find <laughs> out that we think communist China is evil. Yeah. Thank you guys for this conversation. Thank you. Thanks also to David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to our financial supporters. We appreciate you helping us keep the show going. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, haltingtowardszion.com. Actually, you might still have to go to Anchor for that. Not sure. <laughs> we'll let you know next week. <laughs> Send us an email, haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Let us know if you want a Discord server. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>